A little while back, I made a video covering my ultimate router, which obviously isn't the ultimate router, but for me, it's perfect, as it runs PFSense and a virtual machine with the option to run bare metal, and also runs a few other containers for network-related services. I've been really happy with my setup, but then this showed up. Did I pick the wrong router? Let's find out. This is the Linkstar H68K from Seed Studio, a tiny, and I mean tiny, ARM-based machine featuring a Rockchip RK3568 SoC with a 4-core A55 ARM processor and Mali G52 2EE graphics processor, which supports 4K decode and 1080p encode. And this specific model has four gigabytes of memory. The most notable things here though are probably the antennas and four network interfaces. The Linkstar has two gigabit interfaces on the front, as well as two two and a half gigabit interfaces on the side. The two antennas are connected to an M7921E Wi-Fi module, which supports Wi-Fi 6. It has 32 gigabytes of onboard eMMC storage, as well as a micro SD card slot. Alongside the plethora of network interfaces are a variety of USB ports, as well as an HDMI port, audio jack, and barrel jack for DC power although it doesn't include a DC adapter by default. You can either pay a little bit extra for one, or supposedly you can use the Type-C port, but I imagine you would at least need a two amp power supply for that to work. I'm a pretty big fan of the look and size of this thing, and it's kind of cute with the little antennas. In line with its small size is a small power draw, which was only slightly over seven watts max from the wall, and it often idled a bit lower than that at around five or six watts. However, it does get a bit warm to the touch. That probably makes sense though, being passively cooled. The Linkstar is marketed as being able to do a lot of things and comes pre-installed with Android. But come on, this thing is a router. To be fair, there is a cheaper version with no built-in Wi-Fi and only two gigabytes of RAM, but it still has the four network ports. And I don't know why else you would need that many ethernet ports if not for a router. Being ARM-based, PFSense or OpenSense are pretty much out of the question, but fortunately there's OpenWRT, which is designed specifically for embedded systems. And Seed Studio even has a special fork specifically for the Linkstar, but this gets a little weird. OpenWRT, as the name suggests, is open source, but the fork for the Linkstar has been kept private up until just recently. But it seems like if you try to compile the released code and install it manually, there are some issues. So I'll be honest, I don't entirely understand what's going on here. I'm not a developer, but I really hope that Seed is moving towards opening up their version of OpenWRT to the public at some point. Also, the documentation for the Linkstar is lacking slightly in some areas, but fortunately, there are some great guides on some of the things I'll be covering. Outside of that, though, it might take some tinkering. To get started, I just downloaded the release they provide, which uses OpenWRT as well as Lucy, I believe that's how it's pronounced, which is the web user interface for managing OpenWRT. After flashing it to an SD card with Belena Etcher, I ran a cable from my local network to ETH0, which is the WAN port by default, and then connected ETH1 to a small switch so I could connect my desktop and any other devices. After plugging in the SD card and booting it up, I was able to access the web UI at 192.168.100.1 and start setting things up. I was quite unfamiliar with the layout of things, but enjoyed navigating my way around with how easy it was on the eyes. After basic stuff like setting up a password, I made sure my WAN interface got an IP address from DHCP and then messed around with the firewall rules just a little bit. I just set up a simple rule to block access from my Linkstar LAN to my actual LAN, and it worked as expected. I was really curious about the built-in Wi-Fi, so I decided to get that up and working first. Setting up a wireless network was pretty easy, but I was disappointed to see really slow speeds when testing with my phone. After tinkering for a bit, I realized that I was only on the 2.4 GHz band, even after manually selecting the 5 GHz band. The only way I found to fix this was by manually selecting a channel rather than selecting auto, and after that, things looked normal. Having to manually select a channel is a bit less than ideal though. To be fair, I'm far from being an expert when it comes to Wi-Fi, so it's more than possible that I missed something obvious here, and if so, let me know in the comments. 
Okay, so we've got the two gigabit connections up and working, as well as the Wi-Fi, but what about those two two and a half gigabit ports? Can this little thing actually provide the throughput for those? Well, to put that to the test, I decided it would make sense to test a large file transfer from my mini editing desktop PC over to my main desktop. I started by creating two new subnets, one for each port, and then connected one to my two and a half gigabit switch and the other to my desktop. But no matter what firewall rules I set or zones I configured, I couldn't get the two subnets to talk to one another. Once again, I most likely just did something dumb or missed something obvious. So if you know or think you have an idea, definitely let me know in the comments. I eventually did something much simpler, which I probably should have done in the first place, and just set them up as a bridged connection on the same subnet, which worked just fine. However, when transferring a large video file, I was seeing something much closer to a gigabit connection. I even ran the same test directly over my 2.5 gigabit Asus store switch, and the transfer nearly saturated the 2.5 gigabit ports. So either I misconfigured something, or the Linkstar might not have the horsepower to take full advantage of those 2.5 gigabit ports. Now I did reach out to Seed Studio about this, and I may have an engineer getting back with me, and if they do, I'll make sure to post what they say in the comments and description, so check that for any updates. I do know that the interfaces are running at 2.5 gigabit though, because I was able to get a 2.5 gigabit download from an SSD over an SMB share. Wait, SMB share? Oh yeah, this thing is capable of quite a bit more than just being a router. After adding an SSD with a USB adapter, it was very simple to set up as a really basic NAS. All I had to do was format the drive under the disk management tab, and then set a mount point. Now you may notice that this SSD has a non-writable partition left on it because it was used for Proxmox and just, just ignore it, don't worry about it. After formatting the drive, I went to the NAS menu and set up a file share. However, I couldn't figure out how to create users or groups. And I looked everywhere in the UI but couldn't seem to find a place to create users. So I just set this up to be a public share. I'm sure there's a way to do it, and actually I do know there's a way to create users with the command line in OpenWRT, but hey, I gotta get these videos made at some point. Once I set it all up, file sharing worked as expected, and like I said a minute ago, I was even able to saturate the 2.5 gigabit connection. Now, NASs are cool, but the real trick up the sleeve here isn't storage, it's Docker. Getting a container spooled up was fairly straightforward, except for one thing. By default, the Docker root directory only has a few megabytes of storage, which I abruptly found out about when trying to install the linuxserver.io image for Home Assistant. I tinkered around for a bit, but eventually stumbled on a guide for running containers, and the author ran into the same issue I did. Fortunately, it's fairly easy to allocate more space, and then create a slash opt mount for Docker. Big thanks to so Ra for making that guide. I think that's how you pronounce it. Sorry if it's not. After a quick reboot, I had plenty of storage to pull the Home Assistant image, although this time I just stuck to the guide to be safe and used the default Home Assistant image. And once it was done, I went to port 8123 and was able to set up Home Assistant like normal. But I hadn't quite thought through the fact that I wasn't on my actual local area network, so none of my devices were going to show up. Out of curiosity, I also installed a Jellyfin container, which worked great for lower quality content that didn't need to be transcoded. When I did try transcoding a 4K video, it crept to a halt, but that's to be expected with a chip like this. And who knows, maybe one day Jellyfin will be able to support ARM chips like these, and we can take advantage of hardware transcoding on something like the Mali G52 2EE graphics. That's a mouthful. I'll be honest, right now, this thing feels surprisingly clunky, especially for how almost premium it looks and feels. Hopefully, with the somewhat recent announcement of the release source code, this thing might get a lot of the kinks worked out. I really do hope OpenWRT gets more solid on this, because realistically, that's the only thing that this is really useful for. But that's okay, not every small SoC device like this needs to be a Raspberry Pi. With some bug fixes, this thing could really be the sweet spot for someone looking for a compact, flexible router that can also run some other containers and serve files or media, and also doesn't mind tinkering just a little bit for now. I want to say thanks to Seed Studio for sending this over, and if you're interested in one, I'll have some links down in the description. 
Amazon pricing is a bit higher for these, so they won't be Amazon affiliate links. However, if you want to support the channel, you can check out either my Patreon, where I have early access as well as some exclusive content, or you can head to my website and grab some Hardware Haven merch. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thanks for watching, stay curious, and I really hope to see you in the next one.